G'day, y'all. Welcome back to another episode here. This week was very special for me. It's, it's always special when I uh, get to be interviewed. Um, not that I'm trying to satisfy my uh, inflated ego here, but um, it's, it's interesting to be on the other side of a podcast. And um, this was kind of like a collective interview where myself, Nick, and Ryan. Nick is the founder of MindFit. It's all about thinking better and living better. He's um, a lived experienced practitioner. He was actually the first person that introduced me to that um, that umbrella term there. Um, Buddhist philosophy, cognitive retraining, uh, he's all into that sort of stuff, doing some incredible work down in the Mornington um, area here in Melbourne, in the very south. And Ryan, who is the co-founder, along with his lovely other half, I believe, um, at the Center for Healing, which is innovative outpatient programs that assist people in mental health and addiction recovery. And again, like uh, like Nick, Ryan is lived experience as well, who was talking to me about his incredible journey. Um, we actually um, grabbed a coffee before we um, did the podcast, and his, his authenticity is fucking, it's just next level. It's really, really strong, almost like overwhelming with, with how much detail. So I really, really recommend you guys check out MindFit program uh, on the socials and the Center for Healing on the socials as well. This is a really fun podcast. There's a lot of banter in this one, but we did get into some deep things as well. And, you know, I'm always very, uh, not concerned, but like just aware of tr- how much value I can bring to these podcasts. And the way I think that works um, the best, and you can let me know if it does, is that I try to sit there and I try to learn something as well. So if I shut up <laughs> and I just listen, 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 um, hopefully me being engaged in a conversation that's teaching me something will help teach you guys something too. And let me know, you know, you guys are great with um, reaching out and supporting the show and telling me um, what you'd like to hear from, what kind of guests, what specific topics. And um, it often guides me into new areas that, that I can help with with the people that I work with and just my own you know, my own knowledge, like there were some people that were talking about the importance of relationships and I was, I was able to apply that newfound knowledge to my own relationship. And it's, you know, this is all about growing. This podcast is just a vessel for us all to grow. So uh, I guess it's really exciting. Guys, I've officially launched my initiation program for all you young fellows out there. This does not mean that you young women or women or whoever you are um, can, can't benefit from it. Um, it's just that I guess the counseling practice of the MindMate uh, umbrella is dedicated to young men because I wanted to make it super authentic with the way I could impart my own wisdom onto um, people that are going through a tough time too. But this podcast obviously is for everyone. Um, but the initiation program, it's an eight-week uh, program. It's pretty intense. It's four pillars are pain, myth, hero, and dharma. So I have learned from personal experience and with the spiritual and psychological teachings that I've undertaken in the past couple of years that getting to the core roots of who you are, which also means how you've become who you are, the the belief systems you've taken on, not necessarily from yourself, the experiences you've had, how the world and your relationship to the world has produced who and how you identify yourself today and We kind of call that point A. So that is pain and myth. So we have a look at the pain, where the pain's coming from, and we unpack the myth or the story that you've told yourself up until this point, up until this point of change. Then we unpack the next four weeks, we go into hero and dharma. So we find hero, aspiring to be someone else. We first guide our direction towards other people that are inspiring and we can take bits of them we guide you through a perfect day, and then we take on the idea of Dharma, the Hindu and Buddhist idea of meaningful work for work in and of itself, not for any, um, what's the word I'm looking for here, um, not for any side, it's expedience, so not for not for any means and ends, you know, work purely because the work is engaging, and that's when you find yourself in the timeless present, the kingdom of heaven, um, nirvana, whatever you want to call it, what Jesus was talking about, what Buddha was talking about, that meaningful work where the work is is meaningful in and of itself. Um, It's what Viktor Frankl was talking about. If we can all find that place, and often it comes back down to what you did as a kid before you took on all the shit of the world and all the baggage and you, you know, you chained your heart in all those, in all that pain. 
all of that stuff, what we did as a kid when we were innocent and we were being creative and we were playing because this world is a big, according to Shakespeare, stage and we are all the, all the world's a stage and we are merely, isn't it players? I can't even remember what it is. Hang on, let me just, let me just look at this. All the world's a stage and the men and women, come on guys, this is shocking. The men and women are merely players. I thought I was right. The men and women players. So that means that we have to act in this world. And how do we act? Well, we act in a way that aligns with who we are, which is also fun, engaging, enriching, and hopefully benefit someone else. So this is what this initiation program is all about. And uh, it's going really, really well. The beta testing was awesome. And I'm really excited to have it officially launched for you now. If that doesn't sound like you, counseling is your, your way, just a one-off here and there, or as many times as you want to book in, please reach out. Guys, also too, if addiction and um, Nick's story as well are, are deeply resonant with you, um, reach out to them, the centerforhealing.com.au, MindFit, social medias, have a look. It's really important stuff that they're doing there, and they're legends. They're truly legends. Guys, until the end of the show, enjoy. The pale blue dot. Nico. Yep. How you doing, mate? Um, just happy as Larry today. All right. We need to we need to break this down before we do because I want to talk about this with our guest. Yeah. We have a guest on today, and not just a guest for woke blogs, but we're going to co-release on the mind. Um, sorry, what is it? The Mind Mate. Mind Mate podcast. Yes. That voice you can hear is Mr. Tom Ahern. Tom, how you doing, mate? <laughs> mate, I'm good. I'm happy as Larry. Yeah. <laughs> so who, uh, imagine, who is Larry? Who All right, is so Larry? the first Larry that comes to my mind is Larry Emder. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. i got Larry so, from Seinfeld. Is there a... Was there a oh, Larry yeah. David. David. Co- yeah. Larry David. But Larry David, I don't think he was a very happy person. Because I've, I've been on Seinfeld and I've you know yeah. seen a lot of the documentaries. Done he was research. a really neurotic, anxious person through that process. Right, I don't well, reckon that, he was that, that eliminates happy. one, Larry. So let's talk yeah. about Larry Emder. I'm talking Price is Right. No, I'm Larry talking Emder. the original Larry. Like, so the original Larry. So there was a bloke walking along one day, and he saw this guy, and he was just so happy. Yeah. And then he went to a dinner party later that night, and he someone said to him, "How was your? How are you today, mate?" He's like, "I'm happy as Larry." Larry's a happy dude. Because Larry's I'm always happy. I'm as happy as Larry. Happy. But then it could be like a sarcastic thing. Like if you think of like a Larry who isn't that happy, you're like, oh, I'm happy as Larry. It's like, well, I know where that comes from. You're clearly not. Let's right. talk about your issues, pal. Yeah. <laughs> so it could be taken the other way. So it's the intro. Larry could be Jeez, a really you're not, depressed you're not person. Therapist, no, I'm not good. <laughs> I focus on negative-based therapy. <laughs> Let's look for the... Let's make uh, it worse. Did, did you guys ever play uh, Leisure Suit Larry? No. The computer game? Mm-mm. Oh, fuck. I heard it. I knew it. I heard of it. Yeah, you heard of it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This was... Uh, how old are you, Tom? 26. 26. I might be a bit young for Legend Suit Larry. So Legend Suit Larry was around like when I was too young to be playing it because my brother, who's 14 years older, he had the computer game and this is like Legend Suit Larry 3. There's like 10 of them on like a, a Commodore 64 or a 486 <laughs> computer. Right. And um, Legend Suit Larry was like a game where you were him but it was like a bit of an MA or R-rated game. Yeah, like he was, like he was always, he was always trying to pull roots. And <laughs> oh, kind of, really? but I, so I was like, you know, it might have been nine or ten playing Legend Suit Larry and this was on floppy disk. Yeah. Not like the small floppy, like the actual yeah, big the floppies. Big. Yeah. And the, the whole game had like 15 discs. So basically every new scene you entered, it's like, <laughs> insert disc number six. You're like, fuck. <laughs> you put the new one in. I was trying to see some really pixelated boobies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we were born before the internet, Tom. Oh, yeah, so right. The- what was that like? Was that around when Morse code was invented? Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> the same week. Yeah, the same week, yeah. It was very, peace- Larry Morse. It was very peaceful. It was yeah. very... When was it, like 96 or something, 94? Yeah, 96, 97. Dial-up. Dial-up, yeah. I remember when mum used to do dial-up because she'd work from home all the time, and I just hated it. Then now I, like, rely on it. I can't get away from it. I can't get away from mum. Um, so look, we don't know who the original Larry was, no, but I'm, I'm just I'm happy that Larry was happy. I'm Same, happy well, for Larry. we think we think Larry was either super happy all the time, mm. or he was actually really depressed, mm. and it's a bit of a play on words. Mm. Yeah, 
Yeah. All right, problem solved. Problem solved. Mm. All right, so we are co-releasing this on the two podcasts, as I said. So us three woke blokes are just going to chat about we're gonna chat about Tom, which is going to be good for his listeners yeah. to uh, hear a little bit more about him. Because I know when you have your own podcast, you're always focusing on the other person and them. Yeah, so just Tom, project. Tom's going under the gun today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Shit, the spotlight. All I'm should, sweating. All should be revealed. <laughs> Too many kangaroo burgers. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tell us about Mind Mate, Tom. What do you do? Yeah, uh, the Mind Mate is... Um, it's not as a podcast, really. Um, so I did a podcast with a um, really good friend of mine called Adventure Fit Radio. So it was a, it's an adventure travel company that um, is no longer in operation, but we did about 250 podcast episodes together. And very quickly, you know, it was based around kind of fitness, um, travel and exercise, you know, wanting to combine at the time we were very well vested in the CrossFit world. So wanted to combine CrossFit and travel because, you know, we love traveling as well. And that was his business. And I kind of came on board um, and very quickly the podcast became all about philosophy and psychology and, you know, all, all that sort of stuff that I really, really loved. And whenever we'd get like a sport or a fitness person on the show, it was kind of like, oh, fuck, like, where's the psychology in this, you know? Like, who are you on the inside? Tell me about your addiction. Why do you keep striving to be better? <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. What was your dad like? <laughs> and, um, yeah, How so... How often were you recording? That's a lot of episodes to do. Yeah, yeah, we started kind of early 2017, I think, and um, we were probably recording... We'd catch up every every Friday and we do kind of like four or five shows a day so we'd start off really early on Skype episodes um, for people that were overseas and then um, we had some great guests on the show man like we did Wim Hof when he was down here we just caught up with him when he was here we had um, Chris Hadfield who was an astronaut he spent the most time um, outside of the earth than anyone wow. like 150 days in space um, all these incredible guests and what I was, was just, Wim like? Wim was oh he was fantastic mate he was his energy was enriching like you walk in there like hey man how are you how's your breath man you made the call too and it was just like whoa I love this guy yeah. and um yeah, by the end of it, I always used to sing a song and play the guitar for um, for the guests. And by the end of it, me and him were jamming. Um, oh, we improvised and made this song. So it just became very quickly, it was like, you kind of get a sense of how these phenomenal people live. You get like, a, this is what the, I tell everyone to start a podcast, you know, because it's like free networking. Human beings love talking about themselves, myself included, you know. And, um, and Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Well, we all do. We all have something to say. We all have, we all have a narrative and a voice, and I think we should. Um, but you get, you started to get a little, I started to get a little bit of an insight as to how these incredible people that have done, done these incredible things um, live and kind of what their mantra is. And I was like, fuck, I'd love to do this, but just base it around psychology and philosophy. And, you know, at the time I was trying to work through my own mental health issues with, um, you know, things with addiction, OCD, panic attack, all those lovely Western labels that we give ourselves. <laughs> um, you know, and I started kind of looking at it kind of like a free university. I was like, wow, I've got access to these incredible, you know, um, philosophers and psychologists, people that have gone, moved, moved through their own experience, which I think is kind of undermined in the clinical front. Like, it's so important, I think, when you're building a rapport and develop, developing a relationship with someone that you can trust them, you know, um, opens you up to just that that feeling of safety. I think I think the lived experience practitioner movement is going to be the next wave in in assisting people. I was just mm. presenting up on uh, Brisbane on the weekend at my uh, industry association convention, and this guy got up and spoke about the. Um, it, was, it was more science based stuff but he was talking about in, in terms of a therapeutic intervention what works and there was three key things and it was rapport mm. was the biggest one uh and then the second one was hope so giving the the, the client um, a sense of you know, light at the end of the tunnel that there's a way out of this mm. uh, and then cognitive restructuring was the other one, so literally changing their mind mm. so those three things were yeah critical and i think lived experience practitioners those that have been through it and come out the other side and have that understanding um yeah i think the the powers that be are recognizing that a lot more could you went to that thing down the peninsula that thing. the other week yeah i went to that thing that yeah. thing yeah. it wasn't that you know them reaching out and just saying hey we're looking for lived experience practitioners uh to- no they were looking for clinicians but they 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 asked me to go down there specifically because of the lived experience 
seeing and they wanted to learn more about that and get an insight into that so i met with the national mental health commission ceo which is a suicide prevention advisor to the prime minister uh, and so i had a our chat with her and she was she was amazing she was, you could tell she was passionate about it she and, and our um so many of our thoughts were aligned like talking about mental health the same as you do physical health and you know just just trying to normalize it as mm-hmm. much as possible um yeah we had um uh d one of the girls who works here she was going along to a like a convention thing a little while ago because there was a couple of articles um she was on like 7.30 or something like that. Anyway, they're talking about people with lived experience. It's just at this convention, I had to do a speech. It was to do with um, prescription pain meds and opiate addiction and that kind of thing. And um, she's in a room full of like doctors, psychiatrists, like really high level people. And she's obviously naturally a bit nervous about going in and doing it. And she goes, I was like the bloody rock star there. Like yeah. all, the, all the doctors, bang, made a beeline for her out of the other speakers because they want to understand what it's actually like because you read stuff in a book but it's it's the same when i went to that um cbt workshop with um dom dimatia is a very well-renowned professor of psychology and i rock up and there's all these doctorates and degrees in the room and psychologists and social workers and then sort of nick turns up the square peg in the round hole (laughs) and but after real quickly i learned that not that I was a better practitioner, but I had I had more of a grasp on this stuff. You get it, yeah. You and it. they were all intellectualizing it, but I was living and breathing it. Yeah, and mm. that was the main. I told you about when he. So Dom walks in. He's this seventy-year-old American dude. He's like grey hair everywhere, just no filter, doesn't give a fuck at all. And he comes in. He's like, yeah, everyone sit down. <laughs> and, and everyone's like, oh. And my army background. I'm like, oh, yep, sir. Right now, and I'm like. And he's like, you're all ignorant. You're all incompetent. You're all mediocre. <laughs> yeah. And I'm celebrating in my head like, oh, this is awesome. And I look around and everyone else in the room is going to suffering. Yeah. And I talk to my clients about this all the time. And, and what I realized, I heard something that they didn't hear, which was the asterisk to a degree. And so we're all incompetent. We're all ignorant. We're all mediocre to a degree. Mm-hmm. But when I did my work 10 years ago and, you know, Metanoia. Metanoia. I, uh, I, I, you know, I deconstructed and then reconstructed because mm-hmm. I was in such a bad space. I realised I got rid of all of those crappy, old, irrational beliefs that I should be perfect and I should be loved and people must say nice things to me. And mm-hmm. I stopped being codependent on the outside world to make me happy, and I'd, I'd become inherently happy. So when Dom rolls along with all with his, <laughs> and he, you know that he created stimulus. Everyone else in the room reacted to it, but I sat in there and observed it objectively and then yep. just chose how I responded. Because I suppose that, that stimulus conflicts with most people's belief systems. Yeah, so yeah. you naturally want to defend your belief systems and go, oh, hang on, no, I'm not. And yeah. so I know everything. And yeah. their beliefs create their thoughts, which yeah. go, takes them into those you know, unhelpful thinking styles or those cognitive distortions, and that generates a chemical reaction in the thought, in the, you know, a feeling for them. So they go into anxiety. And all of a sudden they're in this deep sort of suffering. Yeah. Just because an old dude with a grey hair rolled up and spoke words. Well, it's like it's an ego defence mechanism. Like I think a good analogy would be if you are building a sandcastle on the beach and you identify as the sandcastle, when a wave comes along, you're like, holy shit, I'm about to die. But if you identify as the person who made the sandcastle, it's like, oh, okay, cool, I'll just build another one. Or if you understand that the law of nature is that everything is impermanent and it's okay to break down and then rebuild. And, and that's what makes change. a sandcastle beautiful because you're yeah. like, someone makes a beautiful sandcastle, they do this down at Frankston, they make these fucking incredible structures. If they made that out of concrete, you'd be like, what yeah but knowing that it's going to get taken away it makes it actually beautiful it's yeah. like it's like the buddhist monks who spend months creating these intricate mandalas and then as soon as they finish they just get their hands and just push their yeah. hands through the, the man they make them out of colored sand and they just push their hands through because it's, imp- it's practicing impermanence yeah it is yeah it totally is and i mean even the best thing to like you know just bring it back a little bit you know the best thing about having a belief system and a narrative ruined is that you can see all the areas where there you can see all the faults in it you know and then you can build up all the irrationalities yeah it's like oh no wonder i was struggling so much because like you said you know i i believe that everyone owed me something yada 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 but when you take all away the next sandcastle you build may still not be perfect but it'll be better than the one before it's like the different versions of and ryan and i sort of 
um, have different takes on this, but I think it's, it comes down to ego. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's all about me. It's about I, my, um, I'm not getting. And I think when I did that, you know, breaking down and, and rebuilding, I think I, I, d I didn't get rid of ego. I, I reduced yeah. the, the amount that ego influenced yeah. my reality. I yeah, suppose of course. Is a better way yeah, of yeah. We that. talk about the ego because I'm like, you can't get rid of your ego. You need an ego. Yeah, yeah, to feel separate. But then there's like, the ego is not just one thing. It's here or it's not. It's made up of fucking a million things. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like I want to look at these things that I want to change and keep all the good stuff. Because mm. I think we we create belief systems because we want to generalize the world to make it easier for. Um, it's like a less energy consumption mm -hmm. it's like if i get fucked over by a girl and decide uh, i don't trust any woman mm -hmm. it's just easier for me to generalize and live instead of evaluating every single woman that comes my way mm. that's not a healthy belief to have but that's just sort of a way that the brain and ego will conserve energy so i mean the vast majority of beliefs that we have are great they do us really well but it's yep. just a handful of them that yeah. tend to cause all this stress so you can't get rid of ego just as you can't get rid of anxiety because we all have anxiety we all need anxiety and it's funny when the mental health world goes, oh, one in four people have anxiety. I think Demonizes. One, I think one, very... one in one people yeah. experience <laughs> a anxious feelings because if you're going through a fucking jungle and there's lions hiding, you, you are going to be on edge. Yeah. So yeah, if you don't you have need, anxiety, there's something really wrong with you. You, you know? need a degree of anxiety, but in, in the right proportion and in the right environment. And same with ego, I think. And I think when, when people talk about getting rid of ego, I think it's getting rid of the abundance of ego mm -hmm. and, and stop letting ego dominate that narrative. Yeah, I, I think I would, sorry to butt you in, Ryan, but I, I think I would say it, it's, it's more about getting rid of the negative aspects of that particular ego because an ego is the self, or well, it's you know the, the part of the self that you identify with. Um, and we all have good and bad aspects of the ego. You know, there are things, you know, we're all capable of, um, you know, creating massive change in the world. But then we're also, you know, who's to say that we wouldn't have become Nazis if we were in World War II and we were living in Germany and we had blonde hair and blue eyes. Like, that's a very... I remember I was living in France with my um, with my missus and we would have to get up every morning and have to take care of the sheep and we have to feed them and all this sort of stuff. And I could feel in me just this, like, dominating sense of power, like enjoying the power of, like, these little sheep that were just rounded up and I had to feed them and you know give them grain and all this sort of thing and I could feel within me that if 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 I was in in a in a social community that augmented that kind of instinctive driving nature of power that I could become almost tyrannical like every now and then I'd get annoyed and he'd just bump it with the stick oh, and all this sort of stuff we have a future Führer yeah well yeah <laughs> I was just kind of like holy shit there's this thing in me uh, have, have you done work around that thing? yeah I probably need to <laughs> yeah, probably need to right. uh, yeah it's, so, it's, let's, let's it's, go and sit in an office for a minute <laughs> yeah 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 we'll probably cut the podcast I'm going to bring, bring a sheep in <laughs> yeah, yeah spirit yeah. of the sheep don't move yeah. to New Zealand you'll become yeah, the Prime Minister very true very true the Prime Minister no but yeah. you, you're talking uh, about something that's important which is watching the ego yeah and, and and seeing it when it comes up mm. because see the minute that you catch yourself and go oh god i'm feeling a bit of power here and that kind of thing then you've noticed what's going on yeah so then you have free will and a choice so that mm. means you'd be woke that's well yeah being woke being yeah. conscious awake being, aware. being yeah observant of things instead of just staying in it yeah because then if you if you're not woke then you all you feel is the power and then you just get running on momentum and mm. it gets more and more and more and that's how you end up mm. with you know nazis and, and, and all that kind of shit you know yeah yeah so it's like i think a part of the ego is just watching it and realizing that hey it's kind of it's kind of a game we're playing here and it's quite funny so yeah. i like laugh at a lot of the negative oh, shit same. that comes up for me now it's hilarious i've had clients come in suicidal uh, ask them where would you put your life on a zero of zero to ten and they'll, they'll put a two and seven minutes later we're both laughing at the irrationality and hilarity of it and all of a sudden they're ah oh, it's actually a seven yeah right? and because you break it down and you reframe it for them and very quickly they can see how absurd it yeah because you get is. caught up in it don't you you get caught up in that two yeah and then everything that comes in just you're trying to look out for things to confirm that you're a two but out of ten yeah the expressions like oh this this kid's gonna be the death of me. Like, yeah. wow, really? That's a that's a bad one. Isn't that's it? a yeah. huge one. That means oh, I can't. I have no tolerance. My tolerance is that small that this stimulus 
is going to drive me in to my death. Yeah, mm. like that's a fucked up expression, man. That, that's that's a red flag for the uh, for the kid to hear. Yeah, yeah, definitely for the kid. He's like, what me? Yeah, hey, uh, what? I'm not powerful. I'm not powerful. <laughs> yeah, bring me some sheep. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So we yeah. just sorry back to your story, Tom. Yeah. So you were when you were going through this podcast and and meeting all these cool people and kind of getting very interested about maybe what was behind, yep. um, you know, what they were up to. But you said you were sort of going through your own mm. um, battles at that time. Yeah, yeah. It, it really sparked um, when I lost my um, my drive. I lost my sense of identity. I was a, you know, football player my whole life, you know. Um, AFL football? Yeah. No, I wasn't an AFL player, but I mean, I just I, my goal was to always – that was the thing that got me out of bed every morning. It was my meaning to become an AFL player yeah. one day. And um, I was doing everything, good training all the time, you know. Um, that was my sense of purpose and my sense of worth. I wasn't yeah. going to be good until I, you know, sort of thing, means to ends. And, um, you know, was playing senior footy, got to go at VFL, and then I got – cut kind of like middle middle-ish of the tier um down at down in frankston and you know you said something before um when you're in that room and everyone no none of them seemed to hear that part where he said to the degree mm. the the guys um that were telling me that you know I, I was cut all i could hear in my anxious depressed head at the time was you know we're not going to offer you a spot this you're season not good enough. but they yeah. said exactly i'm not good enough but they were saying um you know please come back next year because we'd like yeah, to right. give you another go but my sense of worth was just gone by that time and then i was kind of blown into this world of reflection because i was left idle like my my goal had gone so you know you, you're left with your own head and all of a sudden i was getting triggered by lots and lots of things that i never understood um at the time, you know, I was having panic attacks about all sorts of innocuous kind of... I didn't understand it. Did you go into coping mechanisms like alcohol or drugs or anything? Like I, I didn't. Like, I've, I've had... I mean, food and porn were always my kind of prevalent addictions that I would talk about. You know, mm. it's not in the spectrum like heroin junkie sort of thing, but yeah. addic addiction is a spectrum yeah. to the degree that you kind of have that... how big the hole is in you, you know? And I think I was... Um, struggling with that but I distracted like I would wake up every day at like 2pm eat a shit ton of Fruit Loops and just watch um, movies all day you know I was I was feeding that inferior sense of self um, and a lot of it came back down to shame from very innocuous um, events from my childhood that were just centered around neglect and these little things that I didn't understand why but yeah it, it manifested into OCD and anxiety and lots and lots of panic attacks you know um, and how did you start to work through that stuff? Well, I, I think I was very lucky because my mum, you know, she always she'd always joke about, um, you know, if you ever hurt yourself or kill yourself, you'll you'll be haunted by me. You'll have a very angry mother to deal with, you know. <laughs> and that was like that was so ironic because I started when I started thinking about right, you know, I probably don't have much more. Um, life to give here you know I, I would never say i was suicidal but there was a there was a consistent thought about how i would do it that was on my mind a fair bit um i remember what i was just looking out the window and um i remember that that thing that mum used to say to me coming into my head and i was like oh that's really strange so i asked mum for help and she said to me that writing it down um is a really good really good way to kind of you know detach yourself from the thought itself and then kind of work through it and there's actually a lot of research um, by a professor of psychology james pennebaker in in texas who's actually looked at what happens when you write um so you know me writing and journaling actually became very purposeful in and of itself because uh, you know i love writing i used to write all the time as a child so it was kind of like um coming back to that mm, childlike yeah. innocence in the process of me kind of moving through it but um and it's not a conscious process it's a very meditative sort mm. of just let the pen flow sort of thing yeah well i mean every now and then i kind of look back at the diary entries that i was writing at the time and it was it's just like where the fuck did that come from yeah. like you, mm. you hear about all these people that kind of have these spiritual epiphanies because they'll go home and they'll paint or they'll write something and it's it's just like what the where did that come from you know like where what part of me did that come from you know um and i was writing these things that you know i, I just i couldn't believe where they were coming from um so it was just kind of like a i, I was very interested in psychoanalysis from a very from, you know, where, where were they coming from do you think well i think they were coming part 
they were well they were probably coming from a very suppressed um inner child you know neglected inner child um it was there were these things that i'd never um i hadn't updated my memories integrated them yeah. you know um kind of a as Bessel van der Kolk writes, that was then and this is now. You know, I kind of identified with them. Like, you know, I'm telling the footy player, but I'm also disgusting. You know, that was an inherent kind of narrative that was subconscious. Um, and I see that now. It was like, you know, I'm Tom Ahern, I'm a footy player, I can, you know. Sounds listen, like that, 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 I suck. That, that version of you was sort of stuck in that trauma that you'd created for yourself, to, you know, through those, those words that you heard. And, yeah. and he hadn't sort of fr- gotten free of that. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, my my intrusive thoughts, um, you know, were probably the mind's attempt to find a, um, a balance between what I was subconsciously telling myself and, and how society would view someone that was that kind of disgusting, shameful person, mm. you know. I think that's the – that's a really um, – that's a really interesting thing about – you know, anxiety and, and OCD and these compulsions and things. It's the mind's attempt to find an inner equilibrium between how you feel about yourself and how society would see someone um, that is that self, you know? Mm. Um, so a lot of this work in psychoanalysis, um, I went a little bit woo-woo. Um, it, it really manifested when I took too many mushrooms with a friend of mine uh, on schoolies, just went <laughs> fucking crazy with them. <laughs> um, so that, w- that was really interesting. But, f- you know... Um, it became quite don't gloss over that what happened oh well yeah look we we had um (laughs) we had we'd been doing mushrooms um on and off like for you know a couple of summers here and there and they've actually been really fun they were really fun you know and um i wasn't massively into drugs at the time but you know doing mushrooms here and there was was just interesting i was just chatting to my friend about you know the first time i ever did them it was a really shitty day um it was raining all that sort of stuff and we were just in this tunnel. My mate was kind of looking at his hands. He was like spotting for me. And um, we walked past, past this flower and it was like the most beautiful, I still see it and I can't tell if it was just a lovely purple flower or if the mushrooms just showed me this just incredibly purple flower that I'd never seen before, you know? And I just remember going very inward at the time and just th- just thinking about my life. And I was like 16, you know? Um, so that was kind of my first entrance into different perspectives. Mm-hmm. What I tell people is like, you don't need to do that um, yeah. for different perspectives. It's like, it's no point. It's like going to the gym and um, you wouldn't try to bench 100 kilos the first day going to the gym, you know, same sort of thing. But what you can start with pattern interrupts by just taking a different direction home or something mm-hmm. like that, you know, just little things, put your phone in your other pocket, you know, like, oh, this doesn't feel right. Why doesn't it feel right? You know, all that sort of thing. But anyway, we, we were up in schoolies. We had way too many mushrooms. I think we had probably end up about 10 to 12 grams. Um, these big, big things. And um, the set and setting was really, really off and um, just intense panic straight away. But within about an hour, hour and a half, it would just, it just, I don't know, it just went to this state of, wow, like what the hell is going on here? And I think it was too much um, at the time, especially, you know, and it triggered a lot of things that I hadn't dealt with from a long time coming up. Um, but yeah, it was it was really um, it was very transformative, <laughs> and it kind of forced me to consider these things that I'd um, excuse me that had been suppressed for a long time. So I think the um, challenge of that ended up being very very purposeful. It opened me up to float tanks and reflection, and um, yeah. So I didn't mean to get involved with this, but I'm very happy it happened. So, sounds like my experience when I did the Vipassana ten day oh, yeah. meditation and we talk about I had a eating an orange and it took me 20 minutes to eat an orange because I was experiencing the orange I wasn't mm. consuming it and pulling it apart and just oh my god this is so sour that's so sweet but together they're just a perfect combination and yeah it was it was it was such a surreal experience because you're in such a different level of consciousness yeah yeah isn't that amazing like when you, you turn off the external world just for like a little bit like you jump in a float tank for an hour you know, like this memory comes up mm-hmm. or like you look at an orange in a different way you create a bit of stillness and silence and yeah it's great space room for it. yeah room exactly yeah we don't create room enough mm. I think, anymore i asked someone the other day when was the last time you consciously turned off your mobile phone and then they couldn't remember and yeah. i've asked a few people since and hardly anyone's consciously turning off their phone yeah right yeah, mine's uh, on aeroplane mode every night mm. from about 
7.30 mm. and then back on about 7. Um, and then I turned it off when I went away the other week. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Why, don't, why don't we do it more? Why do we, why do, we do it when we go for away for a week? Why don't we do it yeah. during the week? Because we're addicted. Addiction. <laughs> yeah. we, need the, we, need the, we need the drugs, man. The dopamine. We need it. We need yeah, the big D. It's a funny oh, one, hang on, that's it? the previous life. Hey? I said we need the big D and then I was like oh no that was, <laughs> that, was, that was a previous life I don't need the big D <laughs> I don't need the little D either <laughs> do what works for you man <laughs> I told you about my sex shop story last last time didn't I Nick I told you about my knock on the cock last time so <laughs> I don't think I spoke about it on the podcast no, you but didn't. we'll leave we'll leave that yeah. <laughs> another podcast um <laughs> Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so if this sort of opened up the gates for you to start to work on this stuff, because yeah, I think um, especially with like psychedelics and that kind of thing, I think a lot of people, it, it's okay to have that default mode network shut down and have, you know, different memories and shit come up. But then you've got to be able to actually work through that stuff. Because mm. if you're not, you know, if you're just sort of in the middle of nowhere or doing it, then you might come up and then what do I do with these things? I need some sort of resolution around it. And yep. if people if people then don't take the next step of working and starting to resolve that stuff, then you're just left with all this unresolved shit messing around Do you reckon, do you, reckon you could guide someone to resolution from the outside while they're in a psychedelic state? Yeah, so we'll, mm. there's phase three trials of uh, MDMA psychotherapy at the minute for PTSD. So that'll be probably, what are we, 2019? Next year or the year after, I think they'll probably have in that America. legal in America. Mm. So they'll have actual MDMA clinics um, opening up. So I think, I think uh, yes. I'm, I'm so quite someone interested. So trips, someone trips out on the couch, just pops a mushy on the couch mm -hmm. and goes into that space and then you, yeah. you the therapist can guide them yeah so i think that the reason they're doing it with mdma there's a couple of reasons something like mushrooms or ayahuasca or something it's it's very hard to nav harder to navigate that space yeah. i think you'd not only need an experienced practitioner probably with lived experience of ptsd or whatever it is but you'd also need lived experience of taking yeah. the drug as well so with with mdma so what you're doing is you're have a massive amount of serotonin going on in the mind okay so it's working very well for ptsd because you can go back to trauma events so they're doing it mainly for veterans yeah uh, over there um so you're able to go back to that event but you're in such a different state mentally so serotonin is essentially heart opening so my so heart you don't opening. go into those negative feelings that Correct. you experience at the time so, so you're ex re-experiencing re the memory in this very open-hearted connected space <clears throat> so that now you're able to actually re-encode that memory with different emotion around could it. you do that with hypnotherapy yeah that's what we do here yeah yeah, yeah. so minus the mdma yeah um but mm. that, that's that they're finding eff efficacy because you can i suppose with that drug just get that serotonin sort of jacked right up yeah, right. in that state so um yeah with, with the other they've done mushrooms uh the studies they've done with that are not so much with psychotherapy that is sort of giving end of life people are uh, smoking cessation a couple of those things with mushrooms which has had good efficacy you basically it's just giving people a spiritual experience yeah, yeah. that's all, that's all it's doing get, up, giving, get off the darts and on the shrooms well, so <laughs> that's a good tagline yeah so yeah but what it is it is just giving someone a mystical experience which is ego dissolving which is where these patterns that people get stuck in do come from. So I was, all of a sudden my my body melts and I realise I'm connected with everything in the earth and the universe, then all of a sudden smoking just doesn't seem that important to me. Yeah, mm. And seems. also the end of my life now doesn't seem as scary because I feel like I felt what dying feels like. So I had when I had my when I stopped using drugs and had my big moment, I had one, I was not drug induced, but I had one of those mystical experiences. Mm. And that's sort of what led me to my ego to smash into a million pieces yeah. and realize I didn't need to use drugs anymore. So you can you can do it without drugs. 100%. Yeah, my, my epiphany, I was speaking at this conference on the weekend was my life changing sliding door moment was when I couldn't, uh, I had agoraphobia. Um, and I'm standing there. He, he didn't like aggro's cartoon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, Very aggro, aggressive. Aggro, you're too aggro, it's man. That fucking Anne Marie. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, so the dude, apparently, the dude who had his hand up aggro's bum was a real dirty bastard. Like, there's YouTube I out that outtakes too. in of, the ad breaks as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus. This is a real, <laughs> Loves it. real sick unit. Yeah. Um, but I'm there, like, trying to open my door, lantern door to go outside, and I couldn't do it. And. 
Oh, and this, this thought struck me, I don't know, I, I can't even remember how long I was standing, I was probably in trance at that stage because I'm looking at the door handle for so long, going, why can't I, maybe 10 minutes of standing at this door, and then this this light bulb, lightning strike hit my head, and I'm like, if my mind is capable of stopping me from leaving, like it's... The, there's no physical barrier but there's a mental barrier there it's an invisible barrier created by my mind what's my mind capable of on the other end of the spectrum Mm -hmm. what if i put some time and energy into training and developing and conditioning it and getting it really healthy and that sort of created this tiny little gap and the uh, the only option at the time for me was suicide and so when that gap appeared i fucking shot through it like a rabbit down a rabbit hole and it got me gave me a space to get out go to a gp he linked me in really quickly before the gap closed um, <laughs> with a, a psychologist but you got there like indiana jones yeah. got your hat at the yeah, same exactly. time I slid under the sliding yeah door. yeah we're about to close the yeah. clinic yeah. <laughs> da, da, da. there's a boulder da, 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 da. <laughs> <laughs> jumped over the spike pit yeah got in there held up the skull yeah there's a couple of cobra snakes <laughs> held up the ssris <laughs> so <laughs> yeah him with a whip. give me those yeah and that's so that that little epiphany opened up my mind uh, just enough for me to get out the door and wow. get on track. So it's like, yeah, you're just realizing that moment. Wow, my mind is so powerful in a negative sense. Yeah. But then, then you're like, that's I think most people then don't then bridge the gap and go, wow, how powerful is it if I go the other way? Yeah. But we just, ah, oh man, I know, I couldn't agree more. And like, I just feel like without an aim or without like a vision like what what could your life be like you know if you weren't like this like then we have nothing to do it's like um you know like pain can be a motivator but motivation to what you know like what like what's the reason like yeah i mean i could stay in my room and just stay agoraphobic but like without any reason to get out of the room as well just stay in here you know and for me it was be like for me um it was just very much like, you know, it kind of sucks living this life where I'm just, you know, um, you know, being like having these intrusive thoughts and, you know, watching TV all the time. But like, I don't know what else to do. What else should I be doing? Mm. You know, and um, I just I th- feel I think like the we human need- spirit, though, I think human nature, uh, we know that that's not okay. And so I think. W- in, in lieu of a purpose, I think we have just a natural tendency to want to be social mm-hmm. creatures. So to get out of the house, to go and, you know, we have a sense of belonging, one of our basic human needs. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think that, you know, yeah, we can have a, a life goal or a life purpose or what we want to achieve in life, but I think just breaking it down to a more um, instinctive thing, like, you know, back to animals. Well, we're just mammals. I think we're, we're social creatures. So we sort of come to an understanding that this isn't okay. Sitting here watching TV or playing computer games for such a long time is not what I'm really here for. And yeah, there's so, more. Yeah. So if I think initially it's like when we're in a state of pain or suffering, the motivation is just I want to get out of that state of pain or suffering. There's no yeah, goal or anything we're working towards yeah. apart from trying to be in less pain mm-hmm. um, and, and oftentimes that gets hard because we don't see a way out we don't know how, what that looks like mm-hmm. well we've tried some stuff and it hasn't worked and then the only way out is suicides that's when our mind starts to go well that's my only out here um, and that, that, that expression um we don't move until the pain of where we're staying becomes greater than the pain involved in in shifting and yeah and moving so yeah. we sit in our comfort zone we become comfort slobs and our mental health deteriorates and deteriorates and deteriorates and our soul deteriorates mm. and our spirit deteriorates and we just we just become slugs and sloths <laughs> and then and then i think at some stage and it's probably different for everyone but at some stage we go click this isn't what I'm here for. Yeah, this, it's this the isn't. scales. It's those scale. The pain of keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. The pain of change. They just click the other way. Yeah. Then you've got some sort of motivation. You're like, fuck it. It's and that's be different in everyone. The change. scales are completely different. It's different. But then you yeah. do have to, I think, then change your goals. So coming back to like drugs and a lot of the stuff we deal with, it's like when you you're using drugs, you're, you're still dealing drugs. No. <laughs> Don't Why do you think I'm here, mate? Don't from, confess to that. From man. dealer to healer. That's right. yes. in my book. <laughs> yes. Hashtag. From dealer to healer and dealer. <laughs> <laughs> I deal love. Yeah. Um, and we see it a lot. So someone's addicted, which means I'm in pain. 
and I want to get out of that pain. And then someone might, you know, do the work and stop using. But then early on, that's their purpose. Mm. It's like, oh, I'm sobriety. Yeah, I'm stop using now. And what happens normally? People get around. I'm like, family and friends are like, fuck yeah, man, you're doing it. What? Mm. How many days? Ten days? Yeah. And you've got this real sense of purpose and your chest gets puffed up. Then what happens after like a month or so, no one's kind of congratulating yeah. you anymore how many days. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, so then that's not a goal anymore. Mm. So now if I don't find something, then what happens, I tend to fall back into those old habits. It's mm. a bit like in footy, you win the grand final, everyone gets around you, yeah, yeah, and then week two, three weeks, uh, you get the grand final hangover, mm-hmm. and then you realise, oh, we're, we're all the same again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not the champion. All that adulation stopped. Yeah. And the more I'm attached to that adulation, the harder the fall's going to be. Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's that's my fundamental issue with the pursuit of happiness, because if you live more than three months in life, you realise that you're going to go through... Um, you know, periods that aren't that happy. Like for me right now, having not eaten in a good couple of hours, something that would be happy for me would be like a big meal there, you know? Would, but, it, would it be happy or would it be satisfaction? Well, I think happiness, is, that's my point really, that happiness is kind of transient. And it's just kind of like, if my goal in life is to be happy, um, you know, and then like the first, like if that's my goal in life, that I want to experience the satisfying, lovely emotion of happiness all the time, what happens That's when irrational. my missus and I have a fight and then I feel resentful and angry and shitty and it's like, oh, fuck, but I need to feel happy. So the first thing I might do is be like, oh, well, she's not serving me. But like, I'm just interested in like what keeps us moving through the ups and downs, um, knowing that this is going to be worthwhile, this is awesome, you know, like what, what keeps us going? Yeah. Well, it's a, false, it's a false goal. Like happiness is just so fleeting and it's like when we're attached mm-hmm. to that, then when I'm in actual happiness... I'm clinging onto it. Yeah, I want more. I don't want to let go. <laughs> yeah. And then when I'm not in it, I say I should be in it, which mm. invokes guilt. And um, there's this really cool study done about happiness. They were um, checking people's say, This is how ridiculous happiness is, right? So they would, they found that people who became quadriplegics or paraplegics, either in car accidents, whatever it was, they ended up happier than people that won the lottery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what happens, someone wins the lottery, lottery, they have this massive like, yeah, everything's solved now. Now they've got this set point and they invariably come down from that set point and feel quite depressed mm. and everything. People have this horrible experience of being paraplegic or quadriplegic. It's horrible at the moment. So much shit goes on. After a while, they're set point and they come up and they end up being a lot more grateful for just being alive mm-hmm. and that kind of thing. So it's not kind of yeah. what's happening outside here. It's just all we have this internal kind of set point and expectation, I suppose. I think the person who has the accident becomes a quadriplegic or whatever has to, has to go through a spiritual, mental, cognitive process have to. where they have to continue to detach. They have to adapt and adjust and I, am, I don't identify as a person with two arms and two legs anymore and they have to shift and, and the definition of happiness uh, a lot is content, to be content. So they have to work really hard, work their way into becoming content. Where someone's given a hundred million dollars, they haven't done anything for it. They're, yeah, it's very fleeting. There's no sense of satisfaction. They can't be grateful. They don't. Well, they buy everything. I've got the car. I've got the house. I've got the diamond ring. Yeah, so they've, like, they've, gone, they've gone external happiness. Yeah. Where what we learn is that inherent happiness is is where it's at. Really, I think you um, raise a really brilliant point there, and I think you know. Um, back in the time or the hundreds of thousands of years when our evolutionary circuits were um, you know, actualizing, all of these reward systems were so that we would survive. So like when you go out and you hunt the boar and you bring it back and you carve it and you all sit down together, you feel amazing because you've done incredible work that's gonna keep you alive and keep the tribe alive. But now we can buy that chemical cocktail, we can watch it in porn, we can eat sugar, we can eat, we can do all the, we can get it, externally without actually having to achieve it and i think that's the fundamental reason immediate gratification exactly it's like (laughs) that far i mean i could go and hunt a boar i could just go and get some kangaroo or whatever you know whatever and i think um we have to find a way to make that into our mode of being you know so it's not just like well it's like if you learn to work on your car and change your oil and and fix your car you get a deeper sense of satisfaction where if you take it to the mechanic you miss it i I was reading a story once about a guy uh who was very very wealthy had succeeded in business and everything so multi multi millionaire and then he had a, a daughter and she was in america she was turning 16 and so 
the things like you get him a car if you got the money at 16. But he'd, he'd worked himself up from nothing. Like he wasn't born he into got money. An apprenticeship? No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> he, um, so he'd build himself up from nothing to be successful. And he's like, I don't want my kids to be fucking entitled. I'll just get him a car. Yeah. So he, he did buy her uh, a nice car. But then he got, before he gave it to her, he got a local mechanic to come around and disassemble the entire car. Oh, and so shit. on her birthday, he, she went out to the garage <laughs> and there's this beautiful car in fucking bits. And he said, I've got this That's mechanic coming balls. to the house every weekend for the next few months and you guys are going to put this car back together. Oh, I love that. She had that car for 10 years, never got a scratch on it. That is oh, that's because brilliant. you appreciate it. Yeah. And Amazing. If it's just handed to you, yeah. you there's no value in it. It's you called, do not um, value it. It's called the, uh, the Ikea effect. So they did this study where they would um, speak about how valuable things are to you. And it's like, because at Ikea, you bring something and you have to kind of build it yourself. Mm. Because you go through that process, you put a higher dollar value on that thing because you had to give something over mm. to sort of appreciate and mm. use it. So now yeah. have a think about ourselves and how little people are working on themselves. They're not dismantling themselves and putting themselves back together. They don't understand themselves. So they don't value themselves. They value their car more and they've got this deep sense of attachment. I love my car, this possession. Mm -hmm. They place more value on that and they'll put more money into that than they'll put into themselves. People you know, yeah. don't want to go to seek assistance because it costs a hundred bucks an hour or something and they don't see the value in that yet they'll see so much value in putting some stickers on their car that costs three hundred dollars yeah or spending 350 bucks on a bag of coke yeah it's it's it's, it's this kind of yeah I, I totally agree i mean this has come up in a heap of podcasts with me and nick it's like we speak to people and go how many, how many hours per week are you dedicating to your own happiness and mm. people like look real puzzled they're like what yeah Dedicate time to my own happiness. Not, like not it's happiness, like it's, it's a health, foreign, like your mental health. Yes, yeah. working on we, yourself. It's always that image that we use of the garden. It's like we've got this garden going on in our mind and we just let this thing go. Like it's, yeah. it's, it's, fucking, it's a mess. But you, like, how how good is it when you mow the lawn? Like you get, get the fuel, you get your, your hands stink like petrol and then you stink like sweat and grass at the end of you it. You try to pull that cord 10 times. <laughs> like, oh, you yeah. bastard. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you, you put the mower away, you stand at the back step and have a beer. <laughs> and look I'm dedicating at time to my happiness. <laughs> <laughs> this is good. <laughs> but, then, as well. yeah. but then that sense of gratitude or that sense of contentedness, mm. I suppose, um, job well done where, where you sit there and you look at the lawn and it looks fucking awesome and you're having that beer uh, it's hard to beat that yeah you, you earn self-worth you yeah. do earn it you know like it, it's it's something that i mean you know support networks and having encouragement all that sort of is so important but the god i mean i just think about my own um my own kind of experience like in building my podcast up and like not outsourcing any of it because I just didn't have the money for it still don't um, but it's just kind of like I'm really proud of it you know and there's yeah. not there's not many we get like a hundred listeners an episode or something like that but when someone reaches out you know as I, I'm sure you guys have experienced like hey I just wanted to let you know that I really I, I learned a lot from that podcast I'm like wow this is yeah, amazing it's, like, it's, I feel it's, so good it's not but about you anything. it's about them and yeah and, and it's it has to be like intrinsic values as well like if how good is it you know, I don't particularly play the piano, but if you love the piano and you love playing the piano just because you love playing the piano mm. and then you, because you love doing it, you do it all the time. And then, you know, someone says, wow, that's a really cool song. That's just incredible. And you would keep playing it anyway because you love it, you know, mm. but having that gratification outside as well, is kind of like, wow, like I'm really putting in here, you know, yeah. it's awesome. I think it's a, a balancing act. I try and always think about, well, hang on, Am I valuable as a human, even if I do nothing? Mm -hmm. You know, and you think about you, like, is every human alive? Do they have some sort of value? I had, I had this with a client who was deep in their story, really stuck. Um, and lack of self-worth was just so extreme. And I said, all right, so there's you sitting on a couch and next to you is uh, someone who's murdered someone, a criminal. And next to them is someone who has you know, learning disabilities and um, you know acquired brain injury or something. Her, which of them uh, is more valuable? And she's like, oh, and she she really had to stop and think about it. And I said, which one of them, you know, in the, is in the pecking order of most valuable? And she's like, oh, well, they're all human, so they all are. And I went, so you've included yourself in that do you realize and she's like oh shit 
Oh, you got me. Yeah. yeah. That was I a dumb, am you wasn't even a dumb yeah. bind. It was just a... It was just reframing it for her and yeah. like uh, stop you stumped her into spiritual enlightenment. Just, just stop, <laughs> stop placing your, your sense of worth on what you do and, yeah. and and everything. It's just you're a human being and you're no different. To, yeah. We're all mediocre. We're all, we're all we ignorant. Are. But that, and that can be hard for a lot of guys though because we get really identified with our roles. So it's like you know, yeah, this is, I'm a provider. I work, I'm, 50 I work, hours a week. work fifty hours a week. I'm a partner. I'm mm. a dad. Like we've got all these roles that we play, and it's like well. Who are you if you're not playing those roles? Mm-hmm. And so I think um, a lot of my journey is realizing that you know I am valuable even if I don't do any of these mm. things. Yeah, because then then I could become codependent on my roles. I had, yeah. I, had a, I had two sessions yesterday morning with two new clients. I do a 90 minute discovery session as my first um, touch point, and one of them was in Mount Isa. The other one was um, just sort of near Dubbo, out on out on the farm. Uh, and I said to both of them, like I'm you know, having the military background, I guess, and the lived experience gives me a different capacity to your regular psychologist. And both of these blokes had been in mental health care plans and psychiatrists and all that. And half an hour in, one of them was just going to get this grin off his face. I'm like, why is mine? He goes, because oh, you kick him in the ass and it's exactly what I need. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm yeah. Like, You've got to do Was he the work. ex-army? Hey? Were they ex-army? No. No. Oh, no. Okay, yeah. But they realised that um, I wasn't going to mollycoddle him and said, I care about you enough not to give mm-hmm. you what you want, but to tell you what you need. Uh, and I'm going to support and really uh, be gentle when we need to. But I'm also, you know, going to stick a Not here just to ass. make you feel good all the time. Yeah, you need to no, understand. You, I said that the, my motto for my work is discomfort precedes success. Mm-hmm. And part of your problem is that you've been in your comfort zone for so long you haven't grown you've become a sludge and you've become toxic and so we've got to get you out of that and these dudes faces are lighting up and you know all of their problems sort of dissipated very quickly because they realized that that was that hope there was this oh fuck there's there's yeah. this dude who's and i said i had it when i was in the army i got off the bus and this sergeant in my face like do you want to impose discipline or self-discipline i'm like i don't know yeah yeah <laughs> and yeah. he's like yeah, give me 20 <laughs> and I'm like, okay and yeah 13 weeks later you know the boy entered the army and the man came out the, the yeah. other end and i had i had i had a spine and some discipline and some you know yeah, it was just, and so that's what I try and pass on, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Like this, this is a really um, interesting discussion point, and I would love to ask you guys about this. Is like, men, like if you, you read back, um, someone that really helped me was um, Joseph Campbell, and he was heavily influenced by Carl Jung, you know, um, classic analytical psychologist, and he looked back at all the myths. Um, and you know, a myth is kind of like a social narrative, like a that helps people kind of find themselves within the framework of what the myth is, you know. And our myth is kind of based upon the Christian ethic, but no one would call them a Christian, a Christian, even though that's kind of like how a lot of people act. I'm not a Christian, but I have a wife and kids, you know. And every Sunday we go out and we, it's like, well, <laughs> all right, Jesus. <laughs> but you know, he was looking at um, a lot of the Aboriginal myths, and one thing that the Aboriginals would do. Um, in I think it was kind of Central Australia is like when are the when the younger kids um, the younger boys would kind of get a bit restless um, all of the males would put on their god looking masks and take them out of the forest and put the fear of God into them literally mm. but teach them about discipline I think they also went through like a circumcision act and like all these things but after this ritual of initiation the boy would come back and be integrated into the tribe as a man and he would now have this responsibility deemed on him. And what I think is really interesting about that is like to a certain extent, women have like a biological predisposition to maturation. And obviously I'm not saying that, you know, women, girls become women when they get their period. Um, bl- blokes are, are retard, retards. Yeah, but yeah, we, we but we, like that's a common theme that people say that, you know, men take a lot longer to become, boys bec- take a lot longer to become men. And fucking know if they do, mm. you know. Um, but, but when no, there's, there's, there's like no a... baptism of fire. There's no trial that you have to endure or go through. Yeah, like yeah. Like Greek mythology or Aboriginal culture or anything like that. And I think that's why the army, while it's got its, its detractions and negatives and everything as well, it, it was so... Uh, my mate who su- su- suggested I join the army saw that I was off the rails, had no discipline. I wasn't adding or contributing anything. And going through that, I came out and my parents were like, who the fuck's this dude? You know, mm. I'm, I'm up at six o'clock running Who's around the man? lake. And yeah. Exactly. So, so at so what point do boys become men? 
I've, without not original. Not in this I've, day I've been, no, I'm thinking about this a bit because I've got a boy at home, young right. boy, for 10 right. months. So You're going to send him out in the bush when he's like five? He's 10 months, so maybe like six months. months. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, he's exactly. He's exactly. Right, you're <laughs> old enough, mate. Get out. Swiss Army knife for his first um, birthday. I think about 15 um, is what I'm thinking. Okay, mm. so I, at that age, um, my plan, and I, this is a fair way away, so it may change, but <laughs> is to have some sort of ritual and rite of passage. And I'll probably speak to s- some people I know who are very connected to the land out here mm. and have him go out and have do a ceremony. And I've heard a lot about people doing this, so I think it's really, really cool. So I can't remember the ceremonies at the start or the end. There's some ceremony at the start, then he'll go out and have to go through some sort of hardship. So kind of stay for a couple of nights by himself with his own thoughts, mm. writing out some stuff. And then there's also a cord cutting ceremony done with the mother. Okay. So it's a very symbolic mm. thing to say, hey, from this point forward, there's no, the love's Stand the same, unconditional feet, that. But I, now I'm going to start stepping into my own power. Mm-hmm. And then, then there's going to be an onus to start contributing to the family a little mm. bit, you know, chores, financially, that kind of thing. So some sort of, from that point on, I'm going to be responsible more uh, as a man. Because one thing for me, I, and most guys don't, didn't have it. At all, but that's old school personal development. That's yeah. what that is. And we just met before Tom, and I said sort of my point of difference is I'm got a foot in the therapy camp and also the personal development camp. And and p- big part of my development was going to Outward Bounds when I was 16, I think, or 15 or 16, mm-hmm. and doing a 22 day bushwalking course through the Brindabella Ranges outside of Canberra. And I, you know, similar to that, I went in very immature. And we had to, had to sit on, you know, a mountain under just a bit of plastic for a couple of nights by yourself, uh, and you came out of that, and and it's a maturing process, and that was integral in in my 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 journey. My and that's why I think it's so important because I I didn't have that, and I've seen the negative impact of that in that. You know, there was yep. no. I mean, when am I a man? Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm 18 now, and I go and get pissed all the time. Am yep. I a man? Oh, I've got a job now. Am I a man's got but a that, job? And that's what I say all the time. Is and I speak to my clients very openly about this. Is emotional immaturity, and you know, you operate off the beliefs like I must be loved, I must get what I want, and I must be perfect. I say to my clients, what age comes to mind when you say those things? And every single one of them says, oh, about the age of four or five, mm. and it's such an immature. So you stopped mm. growing there. Really, yeah, well, you you never, yeah. but that's that human nature. It's this affliction we're all born with. It's yeah. that human nature, and people in this day and age, I think, have we don't do the work to outgrow the, those immatures. You look at all the the people. You know, we're sitting opposite a big sh- shopping center. You go in there, and they're buying clothes because they think I have to look perfect, mm-hmm. or um, if they can't afford it, they go into depression or anxiety because I'm not getting what I want. You know, and they have these adult tantrums. Mm. So Joseph Campbell's work inspired Disney pretty much. So you, everything we're talking about about right now, you see in Peter Pan's Never Never Land, mm. Never Growing Up, Pinocchio's Pleasure Island, uh, Simba in The Lion King when he runs off with Timon and Pumbaa. Like this is an old story, you know. But this is why Just we need Star Wars, like all that. It's the same. Exactly, it's, it's the, the same, same template. Yeah, know? exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like fuck you. Yeah, I've got no responsibilities. I've got no strings so the- to hold me <laughs> down. You know, like but someone's still guiding you. Yeah, you know? you're not guiding yourself. Because the issues I had then growing up is then you don't learn to contribute or you just everything gets taken care of which Brie I didn't value money I started working I couldn't save a penny I had so many money beliefs and shit mm. around that that's taken me fucking a decade to sort out yeah um, so this is all this stuff it's like it's like it's easier back then for you like oh this is sweet everything's getting done for me and it's easy but it leads it's like the hard path to happiness um, it leads to a harder life later it's the on the book that I'm writing oh nice yeah. awesome yeah but, so so my clients come in right and they, they've had all these psychologists and everything sort of pull out their notepads and not do this quiz and do this questionnaire and this and that and they, they rock up to me and I'm like right discomfort precedes success the number one golden rule is you're responsible for your happiness not me not anyone else stop outsourcing your stupid happiness right this is why you're going into suffering it's because of your attachments and you don't understand that everything's impermanent and their brains literally fry and their circuits just tss, 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 and, and they start shutting down and then right once we've short-circuited you, we can actually start reprogramming you. Different wiring. Yeah. yeah. yeah so yeah. how do you balance that with um, someone that's been like chronically terrified and is kind of lacking that ability to engage in a social relationship sort of thing? Do you know what I mean? Like, Well, we, we go back and explore 
what that version of them actually experienced and 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 at the time you have to value and validate what they experienced but 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 it may be 10 years in the past turning around and looking at how irrational is it you couldn't you couldn't manage that experience at the time um, because you were young you didn't have the skills tools resources or whatever, but now mm. you do mm. or we're going to give them to you now and you can go back and reframe or, or change you can't change what happened but you can change your perception of what happened mm. so similar to me in the army you know um i experienced sexualized violence so getting strung up naked and hosed and whipped and all that sort of shit and at the time that 22 or 23 year old version of me didn't know how to process that mm. And that's okay, but it's and and so what happened to me wasn't my fault. But it comes back to the golden rule: I'm responsible for my happiness, not those dudes. Yeah. So I have to, it's my responsibility to do the work to to heal from that and to forgive and to accept and to um, change my perception of it. Because so until I, until then, it's an open loop yeah. that keeps coming up and coming up. Well, until I, you can I get look at like that that version of me is still stuck in that experience, reliving it every day. So until a healthier, more powerful uh, version of me goes back and, and helps him out of it, he's going to stay there. Yeah. Oh, so that's incredible, man. That's really good. Yeah. Because, like, yeah. That's amazing. These, these things get stored in our subconscious and in our the subconscious time doesn't exist. That's why people are like, ah, time heals all wounds. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> no. <laughs> Time's actually There's no such thing as time. <laughs> Your hypothalamus is doing this. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now, now, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, so it's, 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 I mean, different strokes for different folks as well. Mm. Some people come and work with me and, and we, we learn really quickly this, is, this, isn't a, this isn't a vehicle for you and that's okay. Mm. There's no judgment. There's no... Um, I'm a bad therapist or you're a bad client or anything. It's just, okay, you're not, you're not in tune with this or it's not your language or whatever. Uh, that happens pretty rarely because I try and keep things as simple and basic and logical. Uh, my, most clients go, this is common sense. So it's easy yep. to absorb. It's easy for them to take on. So talking about the hero's journey, Nick's, quite, Nick's taken the hero's journey really to its nth degree because he's like, at the end, the final steps, like coming back to where the journey started and knowing it for the first time. Well, after Nick went through his breakdown and building himself back up, he moved back into the same suburb in the same street and working in the same building. No shit. Yeah, man. Oh my god. Ten that years is later. Ten years later, like being being around the world. Wow. And somehow, the, yeah, my office now is a couple of doors down from where I was working back then, and I'm a couple of doors up in my in in my house. Really. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's so <laughs> that's cool. So crazy, man. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Wow. I love that. Yeah. Full circle. Full circle. Yeah. Uh, well, we've done an hour. We'll wrap things up in a minute. Tom, I'd just like to get from you maybe. You mentioned Joseph Campbell, Carl Jung. Is there any other like resources or people or modalities or things that have helped you the most on your journey? My personal journey has been um, – EMDR has been fascinating for me. Um, what you were talking about before when you were saying how you experienced um, sexualized violence, just that ability to consciously say, you know, that wasn't my fault. Um, but or, I also don't say... I mean, you're not uh, being it, a victim. I don't tonight. say it happened to me either. Yeah, 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 so of I've course. So I've broken out of that personalization and being a victim. Exactly. And, and so just, it's, it's, uh, and that, that reframe, that different language was, was crucial in creating yeah. that disconnect as well. So. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, no, EMD, EMDR has been um, really fascinating for me. So, yeah... Uh, Eye movement desensitization reprocessing. reprocessing. Yeah, that that going back into it, this is kind of like the way my therapist described it to me was the back and forth movement of the fingers just um, distract the amygdala, that smoke detection part of the brain, and just when we when you talk through the memory, it allows you to reintegrate it as who you are now. So whenever I think of my childhood trauma, I think of it. Um, based upon who I am now. So whenever I see the memory or go back into the memory, I can put myself in there and be like, oh, you know, she she didn't actually, she did, she was dealing with her own stuff and, you know, she, all that sort of stuff, you know. Um, so that's been really big for me. I have meditated on MDMA and that's been very enlightening. Um, but honestly, like, I this is going to sound ridiculous, but my biggest therapy has been open, honest communication with my girlfriend. Yeah. And that ability for, like, I have learnt so much from her and like you know she she literally is 
everything to me because she makes me like I always want to look after myself first but only so I can be a better person for her and because she gives me that meaning and that purpose and then my work is where I can be a better person for um, other people and all this sort of stuff. But her ability to speak openly and honestly with me, which is not necessarily like, hey, you didn't do the dishes and I'm upset. It's like, no, 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 you trigger me severely with A, B and C. Mm. And that's very difficult because it's kind of like, well, I really love you, I don't mean to be doing this. And that ability to work through this sort of thing her her she is just an incredible human being you know and um kind of like the work she's doing with breathwork meditation has just um opened me up to a lot of different perspectives as well um so that's been fascinating um i think that's a really cool one i like that just open communication yeah. mm. like people don't automatically think of that as a powerful tool but it is like it is if you can i think speak openly and freely and own your shit so mm. own your part of it I think that's super super it's important being accountable we spoke on I was, I was up in Brizzy speaking with uh, on the Trade Mutts shout out to Trade Mutt boys <laughs> um, their podcast the other day 120 Grit and they were talking about how dudes in, um, and you know from your background that um, tradies you know catch up oh how's work mate oh yeah busy yeah geez, we're bloody busy when in reality so many aren't busy but they're putting up this facade yeah and so much more comes from that open, honest policy where you go, oh, I'm actually be quiet at the moment, mate. Oh, fuck, well, I actually don't know good dude that's looking for someone in your, you know. And so it creates more opportunity being yeah. open. But people and, won't because they're like, I can't let somebody know that I'm struggling. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Must be yeah. Perfect. I must one be one thing I found in the last maybe 12 months, which I think are the two most important words in a relationship with, with, a, with your partner. Safe word. Me time. It hurts. <laughs> no, nah, you're not getting it. Uh, Back off. Yes. No, you want to keep going? You want to keep trying? No, no, go for it. No, no, keep going. Um, uh, no, nah, you go. I'm scared. Mm. Okay. Oh, vulnerable. Vulnerable. Big thing. As soon as I've just noticed either way, but especially trying to me trying to be step into that vulnerability is when something gets escalated and we're really having an intense discussion about something and things start to get adversarial, to be honest and just saying, I'm scared. Mm. I think I, I, what's going to happen in the future? We're disagreeing on this right now, but I'm just really scared about this next step. Mm. All of a sudden... I agree with that, but only when there's two healthy-ish people in the relationship because I've heard of people yeah. trying to be vulnerable in their relationship course, and the other person would have squashed them. Yeah. And that can... Well, that's a relationship issue. That's a red flag... It is, shouldn't yeah. Be in that relationship. And be, being vulnerable is a is a very conscious decision. Like rather than going, no, fuck you, say having the ability to say, I'm scared, you've clearly thought that through. So if you're saying I'm scared and the other person's hitting hitting back at you, you know, with that unconscious program, that's exactly what you said. It's like a very clear red flag that, okay, this person's probably not willing, maybe, if this extends across time, probably not willing to kind of enter this vulnerable space with me and maybe or, we need or to go to counseling or within, within, they're too Maybe this person themselves. isn't right for me. If, yeah. if, if like you can't you can't have a successful relationship, platonic or intimate, if both people aren't willing to try to Grow. look at themselves objectively. You yeah. Know? Mm. Yeah. Mm. And just owning your stuff. It's like, you made me feel that way. It's like, nah. No. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm true because of this and yeah. I'll own that part. But I just think, yeah, because my, my go-to, a lot of guys, is just I want to win this with intelligence. Yeah. That I can see myself doing it and I'm like, I'm just scared. Just yeah. tell her. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm scared. Yeah, exactly. And then she's like, oh, fuck. And she's like, yeah, so am I. Or, or it just everything that's, becomes that's easier. It's great that you both got someone to do that with. It's really important. Very important. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And like, if you're going out, if you want to win, you end up going out with a loser. You know, and that sucks. Yeah. You don't want to go out with a loser. <laughs> That's a really good way of footing it. Yeah, if you win all the comp- like, I won, you lose. Yeah. Oh, you're She's losing. like, oh, <laughs> okay. You're like, oh, well, this sucks. <laughs> I'll let you win. Oh, now I'm a loser. Yeah, but yeah. We suck. <laughs> well, so, the, I love that quote. It's like, any um, communications should be about growth, not about winning. Yeah. Mm. And I thought, I thought that was pretty important. Yeah. Yeah, all relationship, all conversation, 100%. Yeah. All right, this has been a great chat. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. That's fun. I've loved it. By. Good fun. Three-way. Yeah. Right, folks. Yeah. I said to Ty an email, I'm like, keen for a three-way. Pineapple. Yeah. Didn't even hesitate. Yeah, I was like, yes, dot, dot, dot. What do you mean? I'm keen for anything. Keys in the bowl. Oh, yeah. I'll bring the, sh- I'll bring the shrooms. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you all in the next episode of Woe Blokes. Tom, we'll see you on the next episode of the Mind Mate podcast. Thanks for all listening. We'll see you soon. Peace. Peace.
All right, mates, I sincerely hope you enjoyed that episode of the podcast. Like I said in the intro, Mind Fit Program on Instagram, M-Y-N-D Fit Program, and the Center for Healing, the websites, the socials. You know, you got to remember that an addiction is not necessarily how the news portrays it and all that sens- sensationalism. Addiction is more like a dependence. Do you need someone or something? Do you need to compulsively act out a behavior or reassure yourself or think of something or do something to mitigate pain or fear? If that resonates with you, addiction might be an area that you'd want to explore. And if it is, I'd recommend you speak to a professional. And in that way, these two legends that you just listened to can help. Guys, until next week, I love you all. 